How are you guys doing? All right. I don't know how I'm going to preach today right now. <laughs> um, you know, as Pastor Bernie said, um, it has been the toughest uh, like month uh, for me uh, when I heard his struggle. Um, um, and then God remind me again that what we're doing here is, I'm sorry, oh, wow. Uh, Hoppy is not about just Sunday show. Right? I even talk about this. Uh, and I mean, it's a deep conviction in my heart that sometimes I feel like I'm a stand-up comedian, right? And I have to go up and impress people. And if I say right thing and right word and the funny thing, people like me, you know, then they pay offerings and, and I have to run business and that kind of whole um, messed up idea. And I, you know, I had to wrestle with that. Now, why do I start a church? Why do I start a church? And uh, this this kind of thing really remind me again. The reason we are here together is because God wants us to be together. Because the trials and tests and pro like issues in our life is real, as much as God is real, and God wants us to deal with this as real, right? So I don't want to cover it. Out, or the, we don't want to sugarcoat it. Imagine this is a house church. It's a house that you're sitting around as a friends, and uh, this is where like your family member get together and Bernie share this and we cry together, we encourage each other, we eat together, you know, we're trying to, you know, cheer him up. You know, those kind of things need to happen here very naturally. Yeah? And very spiritually as well. Amen? All right, let's do that. Yeah? I'm going to just jump into the one. I know it's uh, uh, quite a um, time has passed, but today's sermon is a problem and martyrdom. So I might prop talk about the problem today and next week, you probably, uh, we're going to come back to talk about martyrdom. I don't know which one you prefer, right? Do you like the pre uh, problem or the martyrdom? Like, just uh, come along. But because we are uh, Acts chapter 6 now. Before I just uh, read the passage, yeah? Can I just point on, uh, touch on this? Because last week, Pastor Jacob, uh, have you, guys, you guys all enjoyed the sermon? Yeah, right? I didn't know what he preached. A lot of people said, uh, you know, they like him. Right, it don't make me insecure. Right, okay. Uh, I love that guy. Um, this one thing that um stand out to me was that you know one this Jewish leader Camellia saying that hey, if it's God's will, we'll continue. If it's not God's will, we'll fall. Don't temper with what God is, can do. Right. So he's so interested in the truth. What he's so interested in God's will and desire, and that really convicted me because I didn't preach and I didn't get to share with that with you. You know, do you know that the Happy Church? We are not ex we are not interested in habit expansion at all, really. You know, you hear, you're hearing from the pastor's Joshua's mouth, right? Your senior pastor's mouth. I'm telling you, we are not interested in habit expansion at all, and that doesn't really make sense to us to start this kind of church. All this multi side in Melbourne is not really about habit expansion. I really believe the gospel has to travel further than our ability. So we go and preach the gospel. People respond and we begin the community. And that natural process is happening in us. And ultimately, what we want here is God's will be done. Yeah? If God's will is that to close church down and stop the happy church, I will be gladly shut the church down. Oh, I will walk away from this place. I think you should be glad because if that means somehow expanding the kingdom one way or another, then we should be glad doing that. My bottom line is that I am interested in kingdom expansion. And we all want that. We all need that. We want to, we need to focus on that. Can you say amen on this? Amen. So don't get, don't get too caught up into heartbeat expansion. What's the point of we just growing when other church is dying, when the kingdom is decreasing in the city? You know, what we're doing is just part of God's great work in your family, in your work, in your school, right? And let God's will be done. And I hope you guys understand this. I'm very serious about this. Yeah. Not that, not that I'm going to leave church or anything like that. I'm here to stay. I want to stay for the next 20 years. That's my plan. But, you know, it's not because I want to increase an uh, organization. And that's something that really convicted me from the last week's passage. Well, today's. 
Remember the time that when church going through crisis, right? Just last week's crisis was external crisis. Persecution came, right? People start to kill, get uh, like, like get that caught in the like went to the prison and all sorts of things happened. Just right before that, there was another problem, Ananias and Sapphira. Church was attacked in, within inside. Hypocrisy was rising, and God has to deal with it, dealt with it in a very uh, uh, the decisive way. He killed them, right? Today, we're going to look into another problem. Funny thing how the church is growing. And you see that how church grows in the book of Acts. And how the Bible does not uh, hide the fact that the, uh, there is a problem. Even the first century church that we want to become is not perfect church. So it talks about problem. I, I think the reason the Bible disclosed the kind of problems to us is because when People in 2,000 years later, people like you and me, do the church. We may need to understand the nature of a church and the solution of the church. And through that, you'll understand the will of God in our lives, in our life, every aspect of our lives. Yeah. So we're going to look into another problem, that problem that comes up in book of Acts chapter 6. I may not finish the whole passage today, but I'll, I'll just do as far as far I can go. It goes, uh, it starts like this. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, or so it started growing. I don't know which in these days is, but it's a way after the Pentecost happened and the disciples start to coming more. You know? This is the first time church recognized the disciples. So back then, Christian and disciples, is there's no distinction between those two. Yeah, again. Christian, the term Christian came way after this. So when they saw the people get together in the Jesus followers or Jesus freaks back, back then, they see them as a, their disciples. They recognize each other as a disciples. So please don't think, don't think that when you talk about disciples, it's another level up from Christianity. I'm just Christian, you know, there's someone else to be a disciple. No, if you're not a disciple, you may not be a Christian. I just want to say it, I just like bottom line there. Do you follow Jesus? And that's what it means being saved. Once you are saved by grace, in somehow that your heart has changed and you want to follow Christ. And we're going to get better at it. We're going to get faithful at it, right? We're going to grow stronger at it. You know, we grow changes, right? But from the moment you become a Christian, you are a disciple of Christ. Daniel Lee, you are disciples of Christ. Amen? Right. Amen. You have to follow Jesus. Amen? That's what Christian is all about. When you get baptized, you know, you follow Jesus. Yeah, see, this church, we talk to each other during the sermon. Okay. But the problem occurs. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Okay, this is the first time it talks about Hellenist widows and Hebrews widows. So in the church, okay, you can imagine, there is us. The Hellenistic Christian and Hebrew Christian. What it means is that there are even Jewish people, there are people from diaspora when the people actually left their Palestine country and they lived outside, they came back to, to Palestine and they are Hellenistic. Their main language is Greek. And those people who lived in the Pal uh, Palestine continued on generation after generation and they are Hebrew Jewish. So their main language is a Hebrew, right? And when they come together, when they worship in the temple, and we speculate, speculate that they actually meet separately because they use main a different language to each other. So when the church happened, people start to join the church. This Hellenistic Jew and Hebrew Jew come and they're joining in, right? And this is a funny thing. And the FF Bruce actually says this is mainly linguistic and cultural issue, right? So there was already certain division they have to deal with. So if you see the like a, uh, the, the other chapters in the Bible, like a, a Apostle Paul constantly deal with this division in the church. You know, like we have a division in the Korean church, the Chinese church, migrant church, where they, you know, second generation speak English and first generation speak Korean. And actually it was there before, there now. But do you know, if you read the first Corinthians, even Ephesians, and this all about talks about division, but, but the way Apostle Paul talks about it is that division is actually the, um, the twisted form of God's blessing called 
diversity. See, diversity was God's idea that God bring the different kinds of people and build the church together. It was never uniformity. We need to be united, but we are never meant to be uniform. Like, I shouldn't expect people to think like me or talk like me and work like me, act like me, yeah? We all have a differences. I'm a bit more goofy, you know, outgoing person, and some of you guys are a bit more shy, reserved. It's not that you are a not a bad like you are not a bad you are, you are a bad Christian you are just different Christian altogether and God uses that but the Satan what the enemy does is that seeing the differences they turning into division and the church actually go through the struggles throughout the last 2,000 years every church you go to they have to deal with these differences and how are you turning into this difference is into blessing of God, the diversity. We bless each other because of you are different. But all we can turn it into just a, such a painful, like evil, demonic division. It happens everywhere, even the family, right? I don't want to go deep too deep in there. But, you know, through that, what happens? Complaint comes out. Complaint. And complaint is a very interesting word, right? It's uh, the Greek word, the gungusmos. It sounds, it sounds like gungusmos, gungusmos. And someone, I heard someone talking that it just sounds like someone whispering into ears, gungusmos, gungusmos, gungusmos. Like it's like, uh, what do you call, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the what's, what's that, the rumors, they're spreading the rumor. So they don't speak out loud. They don't, nobody grab microphones. And say, yeah, this is what happened. They actually whisper into you, say, yeah, you know what happened? You know, there's Michael Joy from Melbourne. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's single, you know. This. <laughs> or then you go around all that, 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 right? And then, and then that becomes bigger and bigger and it becomes such a, like a noise and I twist the truth and twist the reality and gongus moves. That is the word grumbling and complaints, yeah? And the complaints by the Hellenists against Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And this is definitely the attack from the enemy. This very infancy of the church, the first thing they have to deal with is this injustice in the church and expressed through the complaints. I want to deal with this today. Now, probably I'll stop there today, right? Complaints. Complain. Do you have a complaint in you? Do you have the natural characteristic of complaint? If you go through, face any situation in your life you do not like, your natural response is complaint. I want to point that out today because that's not what God desires in your life. And that is exactly what Satan uses to destroy God's people. See, complaint is not new to the Bible, even Old Testament. If you read the number chapter 11, yeah? I'll just read the number chapter 11, 1 to 4. Oh, oh I'm going to, can I use this? Whoa, well, okay. I keep forgetting. It starts like this. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlines of parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called uh, Taborah because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rebel that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel were wept against that all oh, that we had a meat to eat. Okay, now, see, what's this context is actually the Israelite came out of Egypt. Do you remember that? Israel people got rescued by God in a most powerful way. I mean, what could a slave want more in their life than freedom? They got it through God's power. But sooner or later, they forgot this amazing grace and they start to complain. Saying that, well, we can't, well, how about all the foods that we used to eat? They forgot they used to be slaves, but they rather have that, right? So they start to complain about the food and the condition they living in, the desert they have, you know, that they're living in you know, the condition they have. And that's why they complain. And I want you to on the, on the, uh, the, read this uh, carefully. The Numbers chapter 11 talks about how God responds. God was angry. 
Complaint is not what God desires in us. Because it takes joy out of us. It actually damaged our relationship with God. I mean, in every relationship, works out the same, isn't it? Husband and wife. If one person is constantly complaining, meaning that you are not, you never be satisfied with the person that you're living with, you're constantly offending the person that there should be more that you can provide for me. And that complaint actually damages the relationship. It takes away the trust. It takes away the uh, love. It takes away the grace in the relationship. And this is what's going on in this place as well. But I want you to know that actually complaints, good complaints, right? In the Bible, not all complaints are bad, right? Complaints with the faith, and there's complaint without the faith. Oh, I'm sorry. It's only my uh, here. Okay. Complaints without the faith is this. Like you come, you immediately thinking that, that God needs to give me more. God needs to provide me more. And you, know, you somehow, you have this idea, you know, you directly or indirectly declare that God is not sufficiently good faithful, loving, wise, powerful, or competent. Otherwise, who would treat us better or run the universe more effectively? You know, a faithless complaining is sinful because it accuses God of doing wrong. Yeah? Do, do you know what I'm saying here? It applies to every situation of your life. If you complain without faith, saying, God, you're doing something wrong in your heart, and that is a sin. Sin to repent of. However, there's another kind of complaint. Now, I want you to turn your Bible to um, Psalm 142. Yeah, I'm actually going to just look into that. Psalm 142. Is that okay? It doesn't have it here. Uh, this is a good lesson for you to bring Bible when you come to church. Everybody laugh, please. Ha ha ha. Wow. Okay, 142. Let me just read to you guys. Ready? With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint, complaint before Him. I tell my trouble before Him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. See, this is the complaint with the faith. Because they believe in God. They have so much faith who God is. They bring the trouble. They bring the issues and saying, God, can I complain to you? Because I know that you are the answer. Because I believe that you have the solution for this. You are the only one who have a solution for this. So I bring my sorrow, my hurts, my pain to you. I pour out my complaints before him. That's what I say, verse 2. Do you see the difference here? I cry out to you, God. So you're being just genuinely honest before the Lord. You are on your knees because it's a posture of this complaint of your faith is a humility. You're just on your knees. And God, I'm just begging you. I'm pleading with you because you are good, God. And you can handle this issue. See, it's a completely different attitude saying that, oh, I don't like this. And talking of it, you know, I know I'm going to just like, walk away from all this. You know, this is very different attitude to this. The Bible actually encouraged people to do this. And if it just goes on verse, uh, verse 6, you know, uh, uh, verse 5, I cry to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of living cities. So this natural worship comes out. In this difficult situation, if you complain to God with faith, say, God, you are my refuge. You are my answer. You are my portion in the land of living. So, church, the way that you deal with in your life, anything that is not really and uh, agree with your desire, your plan, your will, you complain to God with faith. And it comes a completely different result. One, you make God angry because you are so faithless and you are so self-focused. But the other is so God-focused 
and you're faithful. God, I want to be faithful to you. You're so honest. You're so broken. You're so real before the Lord. God loves it. God loves that, that posture. God loves that kind of an attitude before the Lord. And He's our Father when we do this. I think that's exactly what's happening Pastor Bernie did to us, right? In front of us. He's complaining to God, pouring out his heart to God together in front of us. Hey guys, now I got nothing to hide. I got absolutely nothing to hide. Just please pray with me because God has answered for our lives, for my life. Complain is not what God desires. Philippians chapter 2, verse Verse 11 to 16 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life so that in the days of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain it's basically saying that hey, complaining is very natural simple reaction to the things everyone does that the world does that that's how they react if they don't like you yeah you know and they, 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 they try to destroy others through the gossips and words and all that stuff. But if you are the light of the world, to shine upon this darkness, you should not be like this crooked and twisted generation. You should be like blameless, innocent children of God. How do you do it? Do all things without grumbling and questions. So let me just finish it off this whole thing today. How do we deal with this? This, one of the most powerful weapon enemy used to church complaints and this um, the attitude of um, this uh, uh, divisive attitude for the church. How do we deal with the uh, things that, that happens in our lives that, that, that we go beyond the circumstantial uh, events in our life without complaining? I have a one word for you. The remedy for that Bible constantly talks about I want you to talk, I want you to really think about this seriously, especially at this point of time. Yeah. The, the remedy to cure your complaining spirit, spirit is this. Gratitude. Everybody said gratitude. See, if you are grateful, if you have the ability to be thankful, right? Then you can actually withstand anything that thrown at you anything that you walk through in your life i'm telling you i'm actually telling you this because it's personal journey as my wife and i we talked about this you know see even if you have everything that you want as a simple man and women and i we will never be able to say that i'm completely satisfied we are not like that we will have the constantly just wanting for us and we always want something more something better you will never achieve the complete happiness through that, yeah? But only way that you can actually go beyond the circumstance, no matter what happens, that you go above the circumstance and you choose to be thankful. You choose to be thankful because you have a reason to be thankful. Every one of you have a reason to be thankful. That reason actually happened long before you were even born. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He secured my eternity. He had a place for me to go. And my relationship with God is completely set. And nothing in this world can temper with it and damage it. The security in my heart. And I walk out today, any place, anywhere. And I say, I'm thankful before the Lord. I can lose my job. I can lose my health. I can lose my bank account. I can lose my friends and all that. But you are my God. You are my father. They cannot be changed and shattered. And I am thankful. And you go beyond, go higher than circumstances. You know, that has how the plane goes beyond the climate, right? And whatever happens, rain and hail, as long as the plane goes higher than that, it doesn't affect the plane. Don't blame the weather. Don't blame the circumstance. It always comes and goes, right? 
but your attitude, your heart, your posture is actually going above this climate. Learn how to go beyond that, higher than that. And that gratitude will really bring out this awesome power in you. So I say that gratitude determines your altitude. Gratitude determines your altitude. How do we go up? How do we go beyond the circumstance? How do we become a man who is so steady and firm and strong before the Lord? Learn how to be thankful in every situation. See, in my journey, I so many, as you can see, I miss so many people, yeah? I see so many single people come in and they complain that they are not married. And I mean, all these married couple comes and they complain they are actually married. <laughs> and there's like, they, they have this, uh, like, uh, always this dissatisfied heart. And I thought if I'm married, I'll be in my life, will be sad. My own you know, how, how are you doing, Sarah? <laughs> You're the most recent girl right now. <laughs> See, do, we all agree as you grow up, you know that this kind of thing never stops. Something's big, something's small. But if you're always circumstantial, your faith is always circumstantial. When it's good, you're good. When it's bad, you're bad. And you are still infancy. That's why, that's why you're not growing. That's why you're always dissatisfied, yeah? Gratitude determines your altitude. If you are grateful every day, things happening around you, learn to appreciate what God has given to you. And you fight for it. You fight for it every day. You know, as a person who's been dealing with this emotional disorder, like a de a depression, it was so easy, easy for me to look, go into this uh, dark mode, right? So every day is my battle. I my battle. So I say to God, I thank you. I start the word, like I say it out loud, I declare it. I thank you, God. Even if this thing happening, even if those, all these things around me, yeah? Well, I know. A lot of people want to be happy. They're saying that I'll be thankful you know, if I'm happy. But actually, it doesn't work that way. I have this uh, interesting quote there. It's not happy people who are thankful. It's the thankful people who are actually happy. I got this from Google. <laughs> not from the Bible. Trust me. What do you think? What do you think, Andy? Do you believe in this? Yeah? Oh, this is the kind of church, right? I don't want to perform here. What do you think, Bernie? I'm sorry. Why oh, you make me cry all the time? In a situation like this, life has a sting sometimes, isn't it? That ambushes us out of nowhere. And our problems are real. Our trials are real sometimes. So you choose to declare who God is in your life and be thankful. And you will go up. You go beyond the circumstance. In this church, this church, this is one church that have absolutely no complaints. Amen. Oh, are you laughing at me? I, I'm, I'm not a stranger of complaints. I'm not saying I'm a perfect. I'm not saying our church is perfect. I have no answer for everything that the people are throwing at us. But I know this one answer. Unless we attain this attitude in us, we'll never go beyond what God has given to us. Yeah? So Thessalonians 5, 16, I'm going to stop it here. Thessalonians chapter 6, 5, 16 and 18 says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Come on church, say amen. It says, always without ceasing in all circumstances. And this joy and prayer and thanksgiving is correlated as well. Yeah. So how did this, uh, the, um, the apostle respond to this situation? Complaints came. They didn't really defend themselves. They didn't really uh, rebuke anyone. They didn't complain back to them. What they did was that, you know what? We're going to actually focus on two things, prayer and the word. 
Let me just read this uh, quickly. And 12 summoned the full number of disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and of wisdom, whom we will point to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to ministry of the word. That gave me so much comfort and so much of wisdom in this as a pastor. So they deal with it on uh, a twofold, administratively and spiritually. They say, okay, let's be effective in this. And so they handled it administratively. So, but why don't you pick some more people? Leadership, this is where the leadership come up. I really hope and pray that some of you guys actually step up, right? You are more than able to do it. And we want you guys to really step up and just do this kind of thing. That's your calling. But my calling and our church's ultimate focus and calling is what? Prayer and the word of God. Prayer and word of God. Church, I want to repent before you. And I'm seeing this, all these issues around the me and my close people. I don't think that I have prayed enough as a pastor, as a shepherd. I just confess my sin before you. I want to be vigilant. I want to be a one that actually focus on them more. So from now on, actually for a while, I don't know when, until when, we're going to actually quiet down all the events. We're going to just go a bit, we'll go back to a bit more basic. I want to encourage you to join in with me. I'll find a way that I can just, I'll pray somewhere and hopefully you can just join in constantly prayer. That's why devotion is powerful, very important, right? And how do we have this uh, gratitude in our heart? You can't do it just because you will it. You have to come to God. You have to come to God and ask God, would you give me the heart? You have to come to God and come to the Bible and show how God shows His heart towards us. Prayer and the Word. At the end of the day, these two things, these are our main things. Let the main be main. See, this is not something that I'm, I want to talk about theological difference, theological ideas. It's not about that. You don't get mature because you study the, the Westminster or the tulip, the Calvinism or whatnot. You get mature through the prayer and studying the word. Devote yourself, understanding what God wants in our life. I think this is a great season for our church because trial is upon us. It's not just Bernie that some of us actually share with me their struggle. The thing is that the church is going really well. We actually hit the highest number ever in our church. Like we actually literally 200 people attending our church, three different sides. Auburn is crazy right now. But in the midst of all this, God, Remind us, what is the most important thing in us? It's not about heartbeat expansion. It's not heartbeat expansion. It's not about offering. It's not about what we do. It's about your heart posture. And He wants you to bring that into your marriage, into your work. Hey guys, are you a grateful person? Do you know that you have a reason to be thankful today? I mean, today, right now. You have every reason to be happy because of what Jesus already done on the cross. Do we fully, absolutely convinced by this idea? And I think that's when church is strong. That's when church rises. And that's when your family will rise, your relationship will make sense, and your posture will change in your life.